Well, let's start Thanks with the chair, me. Jay Powell. You're in favor. Tell us why you're in favor. Well, look, I, th I think uh, we've seen Jay Powell in action uh, for some time now, and uh, in particular, uh, I was impressed by how he handled a, a very dangerous moment for us when governments were locking down our economy and our economy was in a complete free fall. Um, I thought he demonstrated uh, thoughtful, resolute, uh, quick uh, actions that really helped to stabilize our financial markets, probably helped to stabilize the economy. He was great to work with while we were developing the CARES Act, you know, the main legislation that dealt with that crisis back in, I think it was March of 2020. I think also um, sometimes people overlook the regulatory role that the Fed plays. Uh, Chairman Powell has taken a very sensible approach where um, I, I would say the main contribution in my mind that he has made has been a constructive distinction between medium and small banks that are not systemically a threat to our economy versus those giant banks that were they to fail, they would be systemically uh, a risk. He's recognized that distinction and crafted regulation uh, accordingly. I will say I've been an outspoken critic of the monetary policy that this Fed has been pursuing. I remain a critic. I think the, for a variety of reasons, I have serious uh, concerns. But I also think that if you look at his recent statements, uh, Chairman Powell has acknowledged that inflation is running considerably above what they had projected, where they thought they would be. And I, I think he'll be willing uh, to take um, corrective action. So uh, on balance for me, um, I'm um, happy to be supporting Chairman Powell. I want to come back to the regulatory supervisory function that you referred to, but before we do that, let's get to the other nominee coming up, and that is Lael Brainerd. She's being nominated right. for vice chair. I, I, I don't want to color this, but she's been a little bit more controversial at times, including even when she was nominated for the Fed. It was a closer vote than Jay Powell. Where are right. you on Lael right. Brainerd? Well, so first of all, she's very intelligent, very accomplished, very knowledgeable. There's no question about that. What, what my concerns are, and I'm looking forward to meeting with her to discuss her thoughts on these matters, uh, are several. Uh, one is, I think, on monetary policy, she probably um, is even more dovish than uh, the Fed consensus has been. Uh, for instance, I think she's been an advocate of the idea that the employment mandate shouldn't be considered to have been met uh, by looking at just the aggregate, but rather subsets of our population have to also have made adequate progress. This is not a distinction that the Fed is capable of, of really influencing. It's a, it's a bad idea. She's also um, been an advocate of much uh, more onerous, in my view, a more onerous regulations that are that go beyond what's necessary and appropriate. And I think she resisted some of the very modest regulatory relief measures. And she also, I think it's fair to say, has advocated the Fed um, straying from its narrow mandate, in my view, um, and pursuing an agenda that's related to climate or uh, social justice issues that are not the proper purview of the Fed. So for all of those reasons, uh, I have some concerns about her candidacy. We didn't get a nomination on the supervisory vice chair position, which would really right. be at the center of the regulations you're talking about right now. What do you take from that? Why didn't they nominate? And how concerned are you that, in fact, we might get somebody who would be perhaps more aggressive than you might like? Uh, you know, I don't know what to conclude from that. I, I really don't. Um, and look, given some of the nominees that we have seen from this administration, I'm very concerned about where they're going to go. I mean, just consider the fact that they have nominated Professor Omarova, Saleh Omarova, to be the comptroller of the currency. That is the top banking regulator in America. And she has advocated all kinds of clearly socialist policies uh, that would be devastating to our economy and to our uh, a free economy. So the fact that the administration is willing to nominate someone like her it gives me real concern about where they're going to go in this uh, regulatory um, supervisory role. One of the big issues that uh, we're facing in the economy right now, according to many, many people, is inflation. Uh, how bad is it? How long will it stay? What should be done about it? Uh, connect, if you will, the issue of allowing the economy to run somewhat hot in order to get all of the subgroups employed that you referred to earlier and inflation, on the other hand. Are we paying in increased inflation to try to get up to what people define as maximum employment? 
Yeah, you know, I, I think the Fed has uh, missed the boat on this. I was very concerned when they first announced this new paradigm uh, whereby uh, they would allow inflation to run above their target of 2 percent for some indeterminate period of time. If you combine that construct with the subsequent notion that, oh, and by the way, a spike in inflation will be transitory, it's really a recipe for getting behind the curve, right? Um, on the one hand, you are consciously, intentionally willing to let inflation run above your goal. And when it does exactly that, if you maintain that it's all transitory, then the logic is you're going to sit back and wait. Well, the problem is, as we know from painful experience, when the inflation genie comes out of the bottle, she's really hard to put back in. So I think the Fed now finds itself uh, exactly behind the curve, as I feared they might. I think, frankly, they should have ended the bond buying, uh, which is a, a really a, an exercise that would should only be conducted in emergency circumstances. We're long past an economic emergency, and yet they only just last month began tapering. They should have began ta begun tapering a year ago. So um, I think they're behind the curve, and I think they need to acknowledge that. I'd like to see the Fed accelerate the taper and begin to normalize interest rates sooner than they've been talking about. Um, that's, that's my hope. We'll see if that's what happens. Let's turn, if we could, for a moment to Pennsylvania politics. You've announced that you're not going to run for re-election. There's now already some contests to try to replace you, uh, succeed you, I should say, really. Nobody can replace you. We know that. But uh, <laughs> address what's coming on and the Republican Party. As I understand it, one potential candidate has now suspended his campaign. Right, right. Yeah, and I think there are, it's very likely that two uh, serious uh, contenders are going to get in the race soon. I'm not certain of that, but I think it's likely. And I think that will shake up the, uh, the race considerably. Um, look, I've suspected for a while that the field isn't finished. And until we know who all the entrants are, it's very hard to know. Uh, but I do think at the end of the day, when the field is set, which probably comes relatively soon, we're going to have some very strong candidates, and there will probably be a very vigorous primary. And uh, I think we have a, a number of likely to have a number of candidates who, uh, if they do win, could go on and, and win the general election and hold this seat. Um, so I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic about how it turns out. Be that as it may, none of them will be incumbents. <laughs> do, you, do you agree with a lot of Democrats that, in fact, that seat is more vulnerable now because you're not running for it? Uh, look, I mean, just on a, on a uh, purely historical, if you look at the data basis, uh, incumbents uh, do have a, a marginal uh, advantage over non-incumbents. But, uh, uh, you know, I think we're heading into, we are now certainly in a political environment that's very favorable for Republicans because of the wild overreach on the part of the Biden administration and the very marginally democratically controlled uh, Congress. And I think, frankly, that environment is likely to continue. I also think it's quite possible that the Democrats nominate a, a true radical who would be way out of step with the mainstream of Pennsylvania. So I don't know that that's going to happen. I don't know either of those things for sure. But um, I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm feeling very optimistic about our prospects. Finally, Senator, spend just a minute on something I know you know very well, the digital dollar. Is it coming and when? You know, it's a great question. I don't know the answer for sure, but, uh, you know, the way I think about this is um, our native currency, the currency for the United States of America, should have the most sophisticated capabilities of any currency in the world. And uh, that probably means we ought to adopt a digital dollar. But how you do that is extremely important. For instance, it'd be a terrible idea to have retail bank accounts with the Federal Reserve and to turn the Fed into everybody's retail bank, as some of my colleagues would like. The Fed is utterly unequipped for that, uh, very ill-suited for that, and uh, the implications for the privacy of the American people would be terrible. So that would be a terrible idea. But the idea of having a, 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 a tokenized dollar that is capable of being exchanged on a peer-to-peer -peer basis on a platform where developers can innovate and develop new products and services, right. um, I think there's a strong case for that. 